Just a few pics from around that time. Oh, and look who was in the passenger seat next to me in my new Rally Yellow 2007 Chevy Cobalt 3LT package with the black bra on the front. I had blue lights under my car. You see the sunroof and I had a surround sound seven speaker stereo system. This was my upgrade that I got on my own from the car that my dad bought me. The 1997 Geo Prism, the one that I drove until the brakes fell off, literally. <laughs> so yes, the brakes really did fall off, y'all. Side note, um, I was leaving Kansas. Um, I had uh, a few people in the car with me. I was dropping somebody off in East St. Louis, and then I was continuing on my way back home to Ohio. And the brakes was already bad. And so by the time we crossed through St. Louis, the brake pads had fell off. And I, I really do just want to thank God, man, because God has really been with me. The Most High has really been with me. I don't care what people say. People can question the v validity of me, my stories, whatever. I know that the Most High has been with me. I have been in some serious times that could have ended in peril. And I just want to say thank the Most High because He does not give us what we truly deserve. And it could have been bad. The brake pads really did fall off. Um, but luckily I was driving on the highway, so, you know, uh, Kansas is like 16 hours from where home, Toledo. And so, um, I would drive, you know, but when it was time to come to a stop, I would literally, you know, just take my foot off the pedal and let it, you know, ease on down, like, coast, and then, <laughs> I don't know, man, we... Just thank God that I made it through. It was, it was crazy. Oh, yeah. The passenger was Lamian before he transitioned. Told you he was always with me. I would even take him to Detroit with me sometimes. This was when I would come home from school like in this pic. D has stayed in Kansas the summer of 2007. So Lamian was always with me. I was still looking out for D. I would send him money from time to time because he wasn't working. This was the summer of 2007. I went through $45,000. That's how I got that car. During this time, I was the man. Family had no problem with me then because I was giving. There was no scamming involved either. I've never been the scamming type. I actually took out two student loans at the time. Um, they had this thing with Sally Mae, and I don't know what ended up happening, but I ended up getting approved for two student loans, and uh, the plus the money that was left over from uh, the grants and everything that I had. To be honest, I have never been that clever to be the scamming type. I am intelligent, but in a good way. I will admit, I always heard about the stunt queens and how they would come up by scamming, stunning, credit card fraud, identity theft, but I also would hear about how they would always end up in jail. The jail part left me uninterested. I take pride in saying I don't have a criminal record. I've only been arrested one time because I have always been a boring goody two-shoes, a square. <laughs> I don't steal. I don't play that shit. Don't steal around me either. After I drove my car that has zero miles on it off the lot, the next day I was heading south on I-75 on my way down to Miami to see my friends Iggy and G from college. They were brothers. I had a time in Miami. <laughs> Coconut Grove was so beautiful. It literally rained on one side of the road, and I was just so blown away that I was literally at the end of a Mexica. The drive took me 22 hours, I believe. I remember stopping in ATL 
and shopping at the guest store in Lenox Mall. I have not been to Atlanta since 2007. In my opinion, ATL is overrated, overpriced, and overcrowded. After I left ATL, I went to Valdosta, Georgia to see my friend Maya, who I have not seen since then, but I hope and pray she is doing good. That was my girl. Love me some Maya. After I left visiting her, I was on my way to Miami. I do love to drive because you get to see the natural beauty of the land. Miami will be the place I will get arrested for the first and only time ever in my life. Basically, what happened was I had a really nice car in the hood of hoods from what I was told. I was in Naranja and there was a, a drug raid going on. So the police pulled us over. Um, Larry and Iggy were in the back seat. I was driving and one of their friends was in my passenger seat. I told these fools to throw the roach out of the window and not put it in my ashtray because we had been smoking. One of the fools must have put two of the roaches in the taco hell cup. That is what got me and their friend who was in my front seat taken down because it was in our reach. I am telling you, God was really with me. This situation could have ended so bad. I remember getting placed in the wagon that took us down to the Dade County Jail. I was thinking, damn, I didn't ask for the full experience. <laughs> they placed me in some type of bullpen with other guys and I was scared, but I did not show it. Well, at least I don't think I showed it. I had watched documentaries on the jail I was in on MSNBC. It didn't hit me at first until I actually went inside the jail. I do remember one guy in the bullpen saying how the police purposely try to set people up. He said they will plant drugs on the ground, and if you pick it up, they swoop in on you to arrest you. There was a few other people who told the same story. When I went into the jail... I went through booking and they gave me a chance to call home. I remember calling home, but I couldn't get through because it was out of state. Remember, I'm from Ohio. It was at that point I knew I had fucked up. Baby, I was so scared. Nobody from home knew I was in jail. Also, I had never been in trouble before, so I thought I would be there for a long time. But deep down, I had faith that everything would work out in my favor. A lot of things that I have been through, I always had this deep knowledge or feeling that things would eventually work out in my favor. I remember not having to put on a jumpsuit, and I do remember being so nervous that I took my braids down. I remember having to go upstairs, and I was put into a dorm setting, but I sat next to the bars at the front where the guard desk was. <laughs> a lot of people think that because a dude is gay, he would love prison, but that was not my experience. Believe it or not, hooking up was actually the last thing on my mind, and baby, them ninjas was on me. It was one, he was persistent too, and fine. In my mind, I was upset because I kept thinking, ninja, if we were on the street, you wouldn't even look my way, the fuck? I was really pissed about this too. <laughs> he kept trying to lure me to the back where all the bunks was. He said, come back here and chill with me. You can even have my bunk. Bitch, I looked back there to where he was talking about and seen it. it was like three other dudes back there chilling. I said, nah, bro, I'm good. <laughs> These ninjas was trying to S and G me, rape me. He asked me what I was in for, and I told him what happened. He then said, oh, you smoke weed. I got some already rolled up. I thought to myself, oh, he's done this before. <laughs> I said, nah, bruh, I'm good. I'm just trying to focus on getting up out of here so I can get home to my wife and kids. <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> I'm telling you, I was scared. I know people would have thought that I would have been all in, ready to go, but no. He said, Ninja, you not married. And he laughed. I gagged on the inside. I felt so dumb and was thinking like, Damn, is it that noticeable? <laughs> then I remember I did take my hair down and I was wearing my regular clothes so he probably could tell. 
I said, Ninja, I've been married for two years now, and I have three kids. Hey, I had to follow through. <coughs> <coughs> oh, my God. He laughed and walked away. Time was going by, and I'm literally trying to stay awake because it was a lot of dudes trying to talk to me. They was rapping and ho. I thought to myself, weirdos? The first dude that tried me, he came back with a spray bottle in one hand, but he didn't come as close as he did the first time because he was smoking. He would puff the joint and then spray would smell like bleach to me. I figured that is how he was covering up the smell of the weed. Man, I was dumbfounded. I was thinking to myself, this ninja really in here smoking? What kind of world is this? I had so many questions that I just kept to myself. And I thought to myself, yeah, MSNBC, your ass ain't show all of this. <laughs> but now some of the dudes be on cell phones in jails. You can see it on YouTube when they replace some of the bingo shows. Maybe even doing porn. He did motion for me to come back to smoke with him, but I shook my head as if to say no. And that was it on that. Not too much longer after that, I remember being called to go to court. I went to some room and had court via Skype. Y'all, I do apologize about the coughing. Like I said, I have a sinus infection. I get sinus infections around this time every year since I've been in Minnesota. So, I do apologize. I do think it might have been called... I don't think it might have been called Skype at the time. But I had court via video. I was nervous, but I remember the judge looking at the paperwork in front of him. He kept flipping it back and forth, reading it. He paused, sat there, and looked at the paperwork, and then flipped it back and forth one more time before he said, I don't get this. What actually happened here? He said, were you taken into custody over two marijuana joints, or were these the roaches of the joints that were already smoked? I responded and told him that it was the roaches of the joints that were already smoked. I remember him saying something like, you mean to tell me y'all are wasting my time today with this? This is Miami. We deal with kilos of cocaine being left in the ocean, pounds of marijuana being recovered from the streets, and they bought you into, they bought you in over two roach joints? Mr. Savage, get the hell out of my courtroom. Get your ass out of Florida and don't ever come back. <laughs> I said, yes, sir. He said something about releasing me without adjudication or dismissed with prejudice. All I know is it's not on my record. I was released from jail not too long after that. I called my friends to bring me my car. I was still going to I was still going to stay and kick it for a little while longer. Miami is so beautiful. I also wanted to ride past the Golden Girls house since I have always been such a big fan. I still watch them. Anybody that knows me, that truly knows me, knows that I am the biggest Golden Girls fan. I can literally um, recite the words from episodes. When I called my mom and told her everything that happened, she flipped out and told me that I had to come home or she would move my stuff to my dad's house. So I was on my way back to Ohio that same day. When I think back on this situation, this must have been on a Sunday going into Monday because I remember going to court the next morning and by the time I had went to jail, I had been in Miami for a few days. I have not been back to Miami since this incident in 2007. I remember as I was leaving, it felt like I was being followed by state troopers. I did not meet up with anyone in regards to hooking up. I was supposed to meet up with my sister, Erica, who was in Tampa at the time, but I just decided to head home. In my opinion, Miami has horrible weed. <laughs> Baby, I could not find nothing that was not bunk. I am sure it is different today because weed is not the same. Now they have all these exotic and loud types that are actually hybrids of the original thing. Remember, anything without seeds is a hybrid and not original. I do remember going down Ocean Drive, which was so damn beautiful and lively. I visited Wet Willies too.
South Beach is beautiful and I did go to the legendary Club Boy. I had an amazing time in Miami in spite of being arrested. <laughs> Nothing compares to Malibu, California. I love the song Malibu by Ho. A place I would love to visit is Venice, Italy, Rome, and Paris too. Also, the door of no return and Ghana. Anyway, what I did not know is that the Most High was getting tired of my shit. This was actually the beginning of my downfall. The Lord warned me twice about my lifestyle before destruction came. He showed me what I was doing is wrong. A now former friend of mine had contracted HIV and was diagnosed while we were at school together, 0607. That was my first warning, but I did not take heed to the signs and who I aligned myself with. I will never forget how I was there for him when he cried. I comforted him and was a real friend to him. When I was diagnosed in 2015, he was not around to come for me. In fact, he was off living his best life. He made new friends, new people he could use, was living better, full track scholarship to ASU, was even driving, which blew me away. <laughs> I never got to see him when he was shiny. It was like he got a brand new start and left me behind but you can't win when you are dirty. Trouble follows him. Peeps had to end up having one of those machines in his car that he had to blow in to prove that he hadn't been drinking. Today, when you hear me say, I don't believe in friendship for me, it is because I have never had a real genuine friend besides Christ. All my so-called friends used me up, whether it was my time, my energy, or my money. I was a real ass friend, but when I looked around, I had none. I grieved for a long time over our friendship. I invested so much into the friendship, but when he was up, he invested nothing. Lesson learned. This is why today it's I have no friends and not looking to renew any past friendships, family ships, or relationships. Cancers, beware of users. Say no. In my comfort to him, I felt like this could be me. The second time I was warned, I was in college, and I had been messing with the second of the two guys total that I had messed with back in Kansas. I had come home to Toledo for a break of some sort. Actually, this was in 2006. I went to ATL for a few days, and then I went to... Toledo, but only because my plans did not go through when I made it to ATL. I was supposed to meet up with this guy that I had been talking to, but he never showed up when I got there. I did meet someone else that I had been talking to, Plan B, but found out he was a liar. He lied about having his own place, car, job, money, you know, the typical stuff that someone that some of these dudes be lying about. Thank God I had a cousin who lived down there at the time. She had a nice home in the Greenbrier Mall area. I stayed with her for those few days, but I wasn't on meeting anyone else. I took it as a sign that the guys in ATL must be liars. Today, I know I am correct. <laughs> While I was at home during break from school, I had heard from my now former friend that people were saying the guy I had been messing around with was HIV positive. The guy lived in Wichita, Kansas, and I met him with my friends, and I would go down there. My former friend, whom I was looking out for because he was still in Kansas at the time because of school, had heard all of this tea from the dude that he, my former friend, was messing with. I guess the guy my former friend was messing with and the guy I had been involved with were former lovers. After I had gotten off the phone with my now former friend, I will never forget that night. I was sitting in my car on the corner of Upton and Monroe. I think I was going to Gino's Pizza, the best pizza in Toledo. I do remember it being late at night, but Ohio is one hour ahead of Kansas when it comes to the time zones. I called this man and I asked him did he have HIV. He told me he did. That scared the hell out of me. I went off on the dude. At the end, I asked why he couldn't keep it real with me, and he said um, he was undetectable and we always used condoms. He made sure of that. 
that was the last time I talked to him ever again. I went to go get tested and the results came back negative. That night I was at the stoplight. I was told by the most high that he was tired of saving me. And if I didn't stop living my reckless lifestyle, destruction would come. I can't say I was not warned, which is why I know he warns others too. Knowing what I know today, he uses me as a warning. I was sent to warn people in these secret societies like Bingo and, and Hollywood. I am in no way proud of the things I have done. I'm telling you this because I want you to know living reckless is not worth it in the end. I am paying for everything I did and that is real. You might get away today, but eventually you will get caught up. I'm still here by the grace of the Most High, Ahaya Ashar Ahaya. It was around the end of 2008 going into 2009. I would start a seven year cycle of the Most High stripping me of everything. Before this point, I was the type to have, I was the type to had to have my guests clothes, my hair was long, and I was living my life. Am I dealing with people? I could be very mean, but not messy nor fake. I did hurtful things to people, but I paid for my actions as well. I ended up coming home to Toledo from dropping out of college around the end of 2008. I lived with my mom and her wife for a while. That hot yellow car that I worshipped was repossessed. This is the time I was talking about earlier, how I could not find a good paying job and my family had blocked me from entering the skilled trades. I applied for Promessica Toledo Hospital. Promessica because they are pro at messing everything up. <laughs> I started working for the hospital where I did environmental services, housekeeping. I would work at the hospital for almost four years. I went from housekeeping to being a nurse aide on the cardiac intermediate step down unit. At that time, I wanted to be a nurse until I became a nurse aide and seen how miserable the job slash people are. I do miss my friends from that time period. Francis and Christina, those were my girls. I hope they are both doing great, them and their families. Robin T, Colleen, she was such a sweetheart, our great RNs. I actually was a really good nurse aide. The pay was not the best, but I didn't mind the job. I worked nights, 7P to 7A. I really did like my director, Tony. He was a great man. I don't believe he has a racist bone in his body. I wish him the best. The worst supervisor I had ever came into contact was this white bitch by the name of Jen K and Dawn who worked the morning shift. Oh, Dawn was a real bitch. I think they were both being abused at home, maybe. Seriously, because the way they would come in with that defeated spirit trying to front like they are so much, it was uncalled for. I think the whole Jen K might be married now, but she worked the night shift as a supervisor. Her and this nurse named Cindy got on my last nerves. Cindy was nothing but a bully to the other nurses and even the supervisors. <laughs> She used to have Dennis, another souvenir that I think is an adulterer, so scared. But her big juggernaut looking ass met her match with me. I used to get with her ass because she was a rude ass bully that was very mean to her patients. She was old and needed to retire like this other weirdo named Trisha, who was like a psychedelic weirdo. Lindsay, a blonde, was very cool. She was very pretty. But my girl was Tanya. 